happy Monday. We are in it for another study session. We're actually going to be going over Rye syndrome today. And if you don't know what's happening right now, if you don't know what's happening right now, we are here to make sure. Oh, first of all, I'm Regina Callion, MSN RN. And I'm here to make sure that if you're studying in my V2 program, you know exactly what to do to make sure that you have success getting through the program and getting the content that you need. So again, we're studying Rye syndrome. Let's take a look at the study calendar. Rye syndrome actually is found in the Quick Facts book. So there's two books that you guys are studying. You're studying, this is your lecture book. This is your content quick overview book. So I like to do subjects from this book because sometimes if you're an audio visual learner, it may take you a little bit longer if you're just reading sometimes, okay? So anyways, Rye syndrome is what we're talking about today. It comes from... Study session number 17. So if I blow this up for you to see it just a little bit, um, there are no videos to watch in study session number 17, but there is a lot of quick facts work. So quick facts um, will be pages 71 through 80. Rye syndrome is in that grouping. And then you also would go back and do some cultural considerations here. So we have the quick facts for the um, Filipino patient, the Jehovah's Witness, the Orthodox Jewish, the Protestant, and Roman Catholicism too. So that is what the studying would look like from quick facts. Some people ask me all the time, how do I study quick facts? If you're following the V2 study calendar, then every time you study quick facts, you're going to do some from the front, and then you're going to go to the, the back of the book, which is farm or cultural competence. So we're doing Rye syndrome again. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi to my Remar family. How is everybody on this Monday? So I do have this out because Rye syndrome does not take long at all to know the major points. Literally, this is, this is going to be a very easy breezy topic review for us. Okay. So here we go. Rye syndrome. Let's do this really quickly. We're going to talk about the two major elements that are always present when this condition arises. So in order for Raya syndrome to happen, what is the medication that is involved? What has the patient been given? Okay. What has the patient been given with Raya syndrome? Come on, give it to me. Give it to me. Like I said, if you guys do this review with me and do the questions that I have in the back, woo, and then read the things that I have for quick facts, you're going to be on it. Okay. So very good. I see it. So the patient with Rye syndrome is always going to have this in their system. Okay. They're, they're always going to have aspirin in their system. That is the medication. And then what is the illness that is combined with aspirin that makes this syndrome happen? And remember, this is going to be in the pediatric population. So typically, uh, between the ages of four, four and 12, between the ages of, of four and 12. So we're looking for aspirin plus what type of illness? Am I like respiratory illness? Uh, kind of respiratory is a good start, but I think Shukar, you got it. Yes. We are talking about this. Ah. And what I see, mm, let me see, let me do the abbreviations for that. Viral infections, viral infections. Now, what I see happening for NCLEX in, in terms of looking at these two, the variations that you could see is, yes, a nurse can give this medication aspirin to a patient who has a viral infection, but sometimes patients may be on aspirin therapy already, right? aspirin therapy already and it becomes flu season or if it's children RSV season, right? So they get a viral infection while on aspirin therapy. So you definitely have to monitor for Raya syndrome like that. So that, that could be a way too. Another thing that I wanted to talk about is the viral infection. So typically for NCLEX, what kind of viral infections will be mentioned? There, there's two that are going to be mentioned the most for a viral infection when it comes to Raya syndrome. And 
think about the population that we're talking about. So if we are talking about pediatric conditions, what viral infections is another huge disease process for the NCLEX that we're studying anyway? So yes, one is flu. And I'll write that down. Let me use a different color. Peds, and we're talking about peds. So one is the flu, that's for sure. Ah, oh, you guys, yes. <laughs> flu is one, and then yes, the other one, I see it, I love it. This is why we come to class to do these great reviews. Flu and varicella, ah, those are the two. And we're always studying varicella anyways. Varicella shows up in viral infections. It shows up when we study isolation precautions. I mean, we, we know that this is a major topic for your NCLEX exam. Influenza too, okay? So now that we know why, why it happens, now let's talk about the two critical conditions that you need to know and think about the two organs that are most affected and then tell me the two critical conditions that we are that we are trying to prevent in our patient, okay? And if you think about the, the two organs that are most affected, then the two critical conditions are going to be noted. It's going to be easy for you to, to think about. So I see them. So exactly. So I have a nurse already in the house. I love it. I love it. So we do see the major organ that is affected with Rye syndrome is the brain. So what we are going to be worried about is this term right here, get to know it very well, acute encephalopathy. That is what you're going to be worried about, okay, for this patient. So what is it? What, is it? what does it mean if the person has encephalopathy? What does that mean? And then the other acute condition is going to be this right here. It's the other organ that you are going to be worried about. And liver failure, okay, major, major issue. So for our pediatric patients, if they have either one of these conditions, they don't do well, okay, they actually can die. Um, so we now have an understanding of Rye syndrome. This is in Quick Facts for NCLEX page 77. Okay, that's our review. And then also, have the quick facts for nursing school. If you're a nursing student and you have this book, this is also okay. In this book, too, where is it at? It is on page 101 in this book. Okay, it's in page 101 on this book. So, great, great review here. Quick review. Now, let's get into our formal presentation. This is Rye Syndrome. Yes, okay. And again, as we just previously went over as a class. This is all part of getting you where you need to be, all right? So if you're tired of struggling for NCLEX, it's time for you to be a REMAR nurse. And that means this is a whole experience, not just studying for the test, but actually coming to things like this. This is our program. It's part of it. All right. And so we talked about Rye syndrome, getting you that information that you need. It is an acute hepatic failure. Okay, hepatic we know means liver and then encephalopathy, which we also know is our brain being inflamed, our brain being affected. Commonly, I said the ages four to 12. Yeah, yeah. All right. And it is essentially the association of aspirin use with a viral infection. Risk factors. This is typically seen with aspirin therapy in children who have what was febrile mean? Children who have a fever during varicella or influenza. And let me tell you, this is so important because when we're teaching parents, nurses, when we are teaching parents, especially if you work in, uh, if you're going to work in peds clinic or urgent care or a community clinic, we have to really educate our parents on what to do when their child has a fever. Because most parents, I'm gonna just be honest, they have a mix of medications in their kitchen cabinet or their bathroom cabinet. And when you are buying liquid medications for kids, aspirin and Motrin and Tylenol and Dayquil, 
and what are Zerbies, they all end up being the same in your mind. Like this will just help my child feel better. So we have to make sure that we tell them, do not give, okay? Motrin and aspirin are not the same thing, right? We, we really have to hammer in that point. And so that's what NCLEX wants you to, de to demonstrate that you know, that you will tell a parent that they should not give aspirin in the treatment of febrile children during varicella or influenza infections because this aspirin or silicate intoxication is thought to contribute to the, um, the damage of the hepatic, my hepatic mitochondria, okay, mitochondria. And so what is the issue when the liver does not function correctly? What do we always talk about when the liver isn't functioning right in our adult patients? Then they will begin to have a buildup of what is that thing that causes so many problems? Ammonia. Whenever you think of liver failure, hepatic disease, think of the patient not being able to excrete ammonia or not being able to excrete protein which then breaks down ammonia, right? And it breaks down to ammonia. So that's why we put our liver patients on low protein diets because that protein that is in our system, if it is not excreted, becomes what? It becomes ammonia. And ammonia is a poison. You know, ammonia, have you ever have you ever cleaned with ammonia before? That that might be old school, but back in my day, okay? Ammonia is something that you would clean like a new house with that you make sure it's really clean and you know how strong ammonia is. So imagine that being in the body, just free circulating. OK. All right. I might have aged myself there. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Cleaning with ammonia. OK. So anyways, when this happens, when ammonia. OK, when ammonia fails to be excreted as urea, it can cause hyperammonemia. And then this can cause hypoglycemia for the patient and then elevated, essentially, sh serum short chain fatty acids, which are just proteins. Oh, man. Bad stuff for our patient. And so what you're going to see in our pediatric patients, they're really sick. So they're vomiting. Ammonia makes you confused. Patients are weak. They can have seizures and into a coma. So it can be very deadly for our pediatric patients, okay? What will the blood work show? Well, it is going to show what? The asper aspartate aminotransferase and alanine aminotransferase, those have to do with what? Those have to do with the liver. So you're going to have elevated liver enzymes. You're going to have a prolonged prothrombin time, okay? The bleeding, you're going to have an increased ammonia level, but that glucose level will be low. That glucose level will be low. So I just put this on here so you can understand the connection between our laboratory values and what patients are going to be experiencing. Very important for the new nurse to know the importance of lab values. How else can we diagnose or doctors might say, how are we going to investigate this? We are going to look at the cerebral spinal fluid analysis of our patient. It is going to show white blood cells. All right. And it's going to have an increased CSF pressure. We could do a liver biopsy to rule out other toxic liver conditions that the pediatric patient might have. We probably won't find anything else. It'll be more likely due to the aspirin toxicity. And then, of course, brain imaging studying can be done, and it will show us the encephalopathy, the cerebral edema, and any other intracranial abnormalities. There are different stages of Rye syndrome. I don't go too much in detail about this particular in quick facts, but I do want you guys to understand that when you don't or, or you're not able to recognize the direction a patient is going in, what is going to happen? They're only going to get worse. They're only going to get worse. Hey, shout out uh, South Africa in the house. I'm glad to have you here. New, 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 new. I, I love my global nurses from all over, you guys. 
uh, make this community so much better. So I just want to pause for that. Um, when we don't recognize the condition that a patient has in the beginning, that patient essentially is on a railroad track to further, further decline. And so one of the proponents of the NCLEX exam is recognition. That is one of you know, the steps in the new clinical judgment measurement model. Can you recognize cues? So let's just look at it. In the beginning, a patient's going to come in and they're going to have some vomiting, all right? So what is the supportive treatment for vomiting? We know we're going to be worried about dehydration and electrolyte imbalances, okay? So we're going to want to correct that fluid and electrolyte imbalance, and we're going to want to prevent dehydration. That is going to be the definite course of treatment. And then also decreasing neurological stimuli, because if you have encephalopathy, the brain is already inflamed and overstimulated. So we're going to try to decrease that. Stage two, maintaining cardiorespiratory stability, because now you're, you have a patient in liver failure, you have a patient with encephalopathy, if it has not been corrected, if it has not been managed, right? And so we are now on the course of preventing or correcting cerebral edema, which can be very tricky if you have a patient on IV fluids. So we have to prevent overhydration. Yeah, that's a thing. Stage three to five, really, uh, if the patient has not had any relief or response to the supportive treatment, because this is the thing, guys, I want you to notice this. When we talk about Rye syndrome, there is no cure for this. If a patient gets into this, if they get on this train and they begin to go in a certain direction, we're doing supportive care because the damage is already done. OK, um, and and so unless you can uh, let me just finish this slide, but this is very serious. Right. So what are we doing in the most aggressive stages of riot syndrome? We're still just doing supportive care. So we're doing the management of cerebral edema. We're actually doing terminal care. OK, we're doing anticoagulation therapy and we're going to put the patient on a liver transplant list because the, the liver failed, right? And so again, I want us to understand that the reason why this condition is on the NCLEX and probably every other exit exam for nursing is because if you don't recognize this condition early on, and if you don't do primary intervention, which is education to the parents, if you don't make that point clear to the parents, and they actually give the child aspirin for a fever, more than likely, how often are they going to do that? If a parent goes home and they don't understand not to give aspirin for a fever, when do they typically bring the kid back? Have you ever been to urgent care with your kids? Right? You go to urgent care, the doctor comes in, the, the nurse comes in or whatever, and then they say, okay, uh, let us know how it goes for a week. OK, they'll say, uh, do the treatment and see if the fever goes down and come back in a few days. Right. And so if the parent has not understood the difference between ibuprofen and aspirin, then they will have given that child aspirin several times a day over a week. So by the time we bring get the patient back, patient's vomiting. Right they're 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 weak they're depressed and they're like i don't know i i still haven't you know i don't see any progress by the time we get them back it's going to be very 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 bad okay so at this point our our priorities are always adequate ventilation making sure the patient is hemodynamically stable i mentioned that fluid and electrolyte balance providing safety and comfort seizure precaution you should know what that means Preventing falls, contractures, and skin breakdown. Okay. All right. What does it mean when we talk about ventilation? Whether you're a RN or a PN, um, you do need to understand monitoring respiratory status. What does that look like? What are the normal numbers for respiratory rate, right? Um, oxygenation. 
status. You, you got to know those numbers. Also, you need to understand if your patient needs to be escalated to more, more severe management of their respiratory status. Circulation, monitoring for fluid in input and output, monitoring for bleeding as well, and electrolyte imbalances, monitor for signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. Increased intracranial pressure is its own subject in your Quick Facts for NCLEX book. Take a review of that. Safety, monitoring mental status of patients, seizure precautions, assisting these patients in ambulation and mobility, repositioning. Okay, repositioning as well every two hours. Ah, and our primary and secondary interventions are going to be health education. So, of course, the disease process, we do want patients to understand, patients, parents, and patients to understand the progression of how this disease is. Also, disease prevention, like I said. You want to be able to explain avoiding silicates in the treatment of fever in, in the use of children and instead using acetaminophen. That's probably going to be the, the more recommended one, right? Um, and then aspirin in general, to help prevent this, doctors are not going to recommend the use of aspirin in children below the age of 16. That's just a general overview of safety measures. Okay. Um, again, hey, did you know that if you're not in the V2, we also have a free trial of the V2. So some of you that are watching, you may just be watching me for the first time. Give my program a free trial run. You don't need a credit card to sign up. So you're in one of two things. You are in the NCLEX V2 or you're in the free trial. Okay. And we do on this thing on Mondays, we have this challenge where we have to like the YouTube video to unlock the bonus question. And I really like the bonus questions today, guys. I actually was in the CAT exam and I added some of the questions from here into the CAT exam. I, I mixed them up a little bit, but I did add them so that they are challenging for you guys if, if you're taking my cat exam okay so over 500 watching so we need 250 likes how many likes do we have on youtube now here is our first question let's go let's go guys first question is this a client is monitored for rise syndrome which of the following manifestations should the nurse watch out for number one hypoglycemia Two, increased intracranial pressure. Three, hematuria. Four, code intolerance. Let's warm you up here. If you're just joining us, we did the subject review on Rye syndrome over, 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 over. We have 178 likes. We got to get to 250 to unlock the bonus questions, y'all. So let's go. The Remar nurses are speaking. Ooh. So the answer that I'm looking for, okay, the answer that I'm looking for, and this is the difficulty, guys, of NCLEX. And this is why I do these questions with you. Because when we are talking about the human body, there are, there are signs and symptoms that will take place that will mirror other conditions. OK, so what I'm saying is that one disease might have four symptoms that are attached to it. And some of those symptoms could be found in other diseases. But for NCLEX, you have to recognize the one that is going to be most related to what you're being asked. OK, so with that being said, if you're looking and you're worried about Rye syndrome, which of the following? should the nurse watch out for? And there is only one correct answer here, okay? All right, correct answer. Come on, guys, here is number two, increased intracranial pressure, okay? Increased intracranial pressure. This is how you pass or fail the NCLEX. Raya syndrome, we talked about this. It is characterized by cerebral edema and fatty changes in the liver. Increased pre in, in, intracranial pressure, 
and encephalopathy are the major problems associated with this disease. Now let's go back and let's break down why, okay? A lot of people pick number one, hypoglycemia. You could have picked number three too, hematuria, because we do know that we have bleeding. However, when NCLEX put you in this situation and they asked you what manifestation is going to reflect a certain disease process, you have to be solid in your content to understand the major presenting clim clinical symptoms, not byproducts, okay? Not byproducts of that symptom. So for example, we know what are the two things that are going to be most associated with Raya syndrome. It's going to be in, in encephalopathy, increased intracranial pressure, right? Because of that, or liver failure. Now, anything else that the patient may come in with, whether I said they could have seizures, I said they could have a um, seizures, weakness, vomiting, are those symptoms associated with Rye syndrome? For sure. Yes, they are. However, are they the major clinical symptoms to distinguish this condition from something else? No, no, never, never. Okay. And so that's, that's the difference. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, the reason why you come to this class on Monday is so we can have these types of discussions. So we can look at prioritization because number one, it's not wrong, but it is wrong for the NCLEX. Okay. It's wrong for the NCLEX because NCLEX wants you to be able to prioritize clinical symptoms. All right. So the correct answer was to increase intracranial pressure. Now let's try another question. We're almost, we're almost, we're just 20 away from the bonus. So keep going guys, keep liking it on YouTube. Okay, here we go. So after ensuring a neurological monitoring for a patient with Rye syndrome, which of the following actions should be prioritized next? Okay. Number one, administering IV fluids as prescribed. Two, providing a high calorie diet. Three, encouraging ambulation. Four, putting the patient in prone position. Here's another prioritization question for you. Okay. And this is another thing that NCLEX will do. They'll ask you for the second priority. These, these are kind of challenging as well. Hey, we got over 800 nurses today. <laughs> and we are just no, we, we, as I was speaking, you guys got the, the likes. So we have met our share goal, our like goal on YouTube. Congratulations, everybody. We're getting it in. Raya Syndrome, this is Monday motivation across the nation. And so correct answer for number two is, did you get this one right? Administering IV fluids as prescribed. Yeah. So once the neurological status is monitored, the next priority for a patient with Rye syndrome is the administration of IV fluids. And so Rye syndrome can lead to, we, we talked about that, electrolyte imbalances, fluid imbalances, so metabolic disturbances, and the risk of dehydration due to the vomiting and changes in mental status. So hydration and electrolyte imbalance are crucial for maintaining organ function. Way. We don't typically think about this. When we talk about IV fluids, we're most likely thinking we want to prevent dehydration. But the reason why we want to prevent dehydration is so that the organs can continue to work. So don't ever sleep on IV fluids as a treatment plan. Very, very important. Very important. Let's get back into it. Next question is this. Question number three. In caring for clients with Rye syndrome, which of the following interventions should the nurse prioritize if the client is exhibiting stage one symptoms? Okay. Number one, reposition the client every two hours. Two, provide a passive range of motion. Three, administer anti-emetic IV every six hours. Or four, monitor for hyperglycemia. Here we go. Here we go. Let's go. Let's go. What do you guys say? This one will get you thinking. Okay. 
This one will get you thinking. Correct answer here. Bam, it's number three, okay? So what we wanna do, because remember when the patient comes in, keeping them from vomiting is also, is also important because in the beginning, the, the Rias syndrome client is going to be vomiting. They're gonna be at risk for dehydration, lethargy, hepatic dysfunction. And so it's important for us to give antiemetics to prevent the client from vomiting, which can also increase intracranial pressure and also increase the risk for what? When you're vomiting all the time, you're losing one of the most important things from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're losing water, you're losing water. So we want to prevent them from doing that. And it will help with all the other complications of dehydration. Does that make sense? Okay. Question number four is this. Oh, this is good. A, a child with Rye syndrome is being monitored for the progression of cerebral edema. Which of the following findings best indicates worsening of cerebral edema. Okay. Number one, persistent vomiting. Two, the client is speaking more disoriented. Three, the client reports feeling warm and has a headache. Four, the client is asleep most of the time. We're talking about here indicating the worsening of cerebral edema. When it's worse, is it number one, persistent vomiting? Two, client is speaking more disoriented. Three, the client reports feeling warm, has a headache. Four, client is asleep most of the time. Which one is going to indicate to you things are not going well? And remember, we talked about that. There is no cure for Rye syndrome. So we're doing supportive care. This question, I will tell you right now, this is one of those questions that you could possibly fail the NCLEX if you don't recognize this, okay? If you don't recognize this one. The correct answer is number four. The client is asleep most of the time. How many people are gonna remember this forever? When you talk about cerebral edema, what you are talking about is somebody who essentially is going to have issues with their consciousness, okay? They are going to have real severe problems with their consciousness. So cerebral edema. Cerebral edema can initially cause headaches, vomiting, lethargy, coma, and then death. So it is important for that client's level of consciousness to be monitored. And y'all knew this. But I, I did some, I threw some good distractors in here. Here we go. Look at my distractors. Persistent vomiting. Oh, that sounds bad, right? It is bad, okay? Um, the client is speaking more disoriented. Woo, somebody said, yes, that's the one right there. But what's going on here? The client is at least awake. They're talking. They're speaking to you. What about three? Some people pick three. The client reports feeling warm and they have a headache. So now this person is, they're talking. They're telling you how they feel. They have a headache. They're able to report pain, right? Where it is. Or then four, this person just asleep all the time. You just, they, they just, they ain't talking to you. They not doing nothing. This is the worst patient. And this is a good lesson for you. Somebody right now, let me, you, okay? The quiet patient is usually not the best patient. We think, oh, Mr. Jones is quiet. He don't ever ask for nothing. Mr. Jones is the one with an abdominal aorta that he doesn't even know he has, okay? The quiet patient can be the worst patient. Remember that for NCLEX, okay? Because usually in nursing, what is it? The squeaky, what do they say? The squeaky engine gets the oil. It's something like that. But the one that's talking the most, <laughs> I don't know. Y'all going to correct me on that one. Okay. So anyways, we won't forgive this one now. The client that's asleep is the most. I'm glad you showed up to class today. Somebody's life going to be saved. Okay. Question number five, you guys did do it. You unlocked the bonus question. So I'm really proud of you. We worked together. We made it happen. Bonus question unlocked. Bonus question unlocked. Here we go. Hmm. Okay, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. That's right, that's right what it is. 
The engine can get some oil too, but the, the wheel gets the oil. Okay, so question number five. The client with rise syndrome is becoming less responsive, hyperventilating, and presenting decorticate rigidity. rigidity. Mm -hmm. Which of the following actions should the nurse prioritize first? Okay, let me read it again. Client with rise syndrome, less responsive, hyperventilating, presenting decorticate rigidity. Which of the following actions should the nurse prioritize first? Number one, administer bolus diuretics. Two, prepare the client for endotracheal intubation. Three, prepare the client for a liver transplant. Four, prepare the client for a craniotomy. Ooh. Hmm. What's going to be the best thing for us to do here? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Client. The client with Rye syndrome. They're going down that progression that we talked about and they're getting worse. What is the best thing for the nurse to do? Just pick one. Go with your first mind is how you practice on doing that. Okay, correct answer is going to be number two. Number two, prepare the client for endotracheal intubation. So if the client, essentially they're coming in with respiratory distress, right? If you look at these symptoms, you just, they're less responsive. So the consciousness is low. We know oxygenation, probably a problem. They're hyperventilating. They're not getting the oxygen that they need and they have decorticate rigidity, okay? So what's happening here is you have the encephalopathy getting worse. It's probably inflaming the spinal cord too. And um, it's causing problems for other areas of breathing. So endotracheal intubation can aid in sustaining respiration and breathing. You guys, I literally... You guys did wonderful. Four out of four, three out of five. I would say three out of five because a lot of this, a lot of these things that we went over today, I have never prepared a class like this before. This class typically was, um, I don't know, it was fun, but it was also very challenging to think of Raya syndrome because it does seem pretty straightforward. But what NCLEX is going to do is put it into a clinical vignette or a clinical scenario. And it can be much different, okay? So if you like today's lectures, make sure you hit that subscribe button and show up for class. We have class every Monday at noon, every Wednesday at nine. So I will be back again on Wednesday at nine to go over another topic from the V2 program. Hey, if you don't have the V2 program, let me upgrade you, okay? Let me upgrade you. Um, and you can start with a free trial. How about that? And then if you have questions after that, mm, 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 let me know. I love it. Maybe it says, Lord, deliver me from the second guessing. <laughs> deliver me from the second guessing. Well, it's time for Monday motivation. And here's a story that may encourage you. It is, if there's a will, there's a way. If there's a will, there's a way. And I like to ask this question are you the type of person who likes to take advice from other people? All right. Are you the type of person that likes to take advice from other people? Like when you are traveling somewhere, do you go and look at, okay, what are the best places to go to? Where, where, where are the best restaurants to eat? Where should I, you know, where should I find myself being? Do you do movie recommendations? Do people feel comfortable saying, hey, I saw this great movie. I know you would like it. You should check it out, right? Or do they already know? Do they already know that you don't take advice from people? Like you don't do that. Do you take advice about love relationships or your career or what sh you should be doing? Okay. It it's a reason why I'm asking you this because I feel like sometimes when we are closed off to taking advice from people, we miss out. We miss out. And so it's somebody like, yeah, that's why I'm on YouTube right now. I'm looking for something to help me out. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you the story of Naaman. He is a character in the Bible. You may or may not have heard of this story, but it's so interesting because Naaman is like the type of person who gets the job done. He does things his way on his time. He's like a higher up person. And 
when he receives advice, he kind of is like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Okay. So anyways, let me tell you the full story. So it goes like this. Nabon is a commander of the army of the king of Aram. And he is like a mighty and valiant warrior. He's like the top. But at the same time, he has this clinical condition. Come on, somebody. Naaman is very strong, very intelligent, but he suffers from this disease process called leprosy. Now, do you know what leprosy does to your body? What color does leprosy make you? We, we, don't, we don't have leprosy um, as much. I feel like over time it had become eradicated for some reason, but we don't see leprosy as much. It's, it's super contagious. It turns your skin white, right? You have sores, you have the, the sloughing off of the exterior of the skin. Um, what else do we know about leprosy? It's just like not cool to have. And plus, if you are an Israelite or, you know, if you were a, a Jewish person at the time, it makes you unclean. So that means that you can't socialize with other people. You cannot be around them because this contagious disease can be passed off to other people. So they just don't want you around. Like you're not going to come around with leprosy. So Naaman has this weird struggle because he's very much a part of something that's successful, but he has this medical condition. All right. And so I, I can appreciate him. He suffers from leprosy. And, you know, his wife had a servant who suggested that Naaman go see a religious doctor, okay? Go see a religious doctor. We have a prophet in Samaria who is known for healing. She trying to take him to the king, take him to the Lord in prayer. So Naaman, does he receive this advice, okay? Because this advice is coming from a, like a servant. And so um, upon receiving the advice, check this out. He, he went to the king and sent him a letter to give to the king of Israel to help, right? To help Naaman find a cure for his leprosy, all right? And the king of Israel, that's God's people. So what happens when the king gets this letter? Is he gonna let Naaman go? Is he gonna say what? Okay, so as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? Hey, this contagious disease, like what? Can I do this? He's like, am I God? Can I do this? Is he trying to pick a quarrel with me? And when Elijah, the prophet, heard that the king of Israel had tore his robes, he sent him a message and said, no, no, listen, just send them to me. I'm the prophet. Let, let, let me handle them. And so when um, Naaman arrived at Elijah's house, Elijah didn't even come out to meet him. Instead, he just sent a messenger out to Naaman and told him to go and wash in the river. How many times? Seven times. So that was Naaman's, that was Naaman's treatment protocol, right? Go wash in the Jordan River seven times. And remember, the prophet didn't even come out to meet the dude. All right. So the dude is there, right? And is this like, what? No, no, nobody is even coming out to see me just go like hollering at him from the, from the door. <laughs> so look, Amen, Naaman, he went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. All right. Are, are not Abama and Faisar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleaned? So this man did not get the reception that he was expecting. He was expecting some divine, miraculous, you know, ceremony to be performed over him because he was a mighty soldier. Like he had this high mind about himself. And, and then he's even saying, and look, there is some, there's some cleaner rivers that I could be in, some pristine, crystal clean rivers that I could wash my body in, but you're going to send me to the Jordan River, that dirty river? What? Okay. And so he's like, couldn't I be washed and cleansed in them instead? Oh, Lord, help me. And the Naaman servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Okay. How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? Like they're saying, if he would have told you to go climb a mountain and run around 50 million times, you would have did it. 
So why don't you do the simple thing? This is speaking to somebody. Somebody needs to do the simple thing, the simple, simple thing. All right. And so Naaman went and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. Really that simple. And his leprosy was completely healed and his skin became that of a young child. This is a miracle. This is a miracle that is, you know, it is retold in the Bible. And I love the simplicity of the instructions. Okay. Because sometimes we are looking for something big. Sometimes we are looking for this great, you know, task to overcome. And God's like, it's, it's a simple thing. It's a simple thing. We got to get out of our own ways. Um, takeaways. Take the good advice from others. Okay. Sometimes God doesn't work the way we expect. Getting angry about your problems do not make them go away. Okay. Good results requires obedience. Good results require obedience. This is the simplicity of everything, like everything. I just, I just love it. I just love how Naaman's condition was healed, but it took a village to do it. Like it literally took two kings. Okay. It literally took a servant girl. It literally took a wife. It literally took his servants. And so when you talk about your story and how you got to where you are, then guess what? You did not get there alone. You did not get there alone. And that's something that I really love about believers here in this community. Because I understand everybody here is not a not a Christian faith. Some people, you know, you don't believe in your creator at all. Um, but I do know that, listen, <laughs> us believers know that the little that we have is not because of how great we are. It is because there has been sacrifices made, not by you, but by other people to get you the, the where you have been. I'm able, as a young Black woman, to teach nursing because there were many, many women who were silenced in the classroom, okay? That was their experience. There were many, many women who could not go to college, who could not get a profession, right? And so when we are presented with the opportunity to take advice, take wisdom from somebody that has already been there, y'all listen to them, listen to them. And, and the same with your Christian journey too, because God is not looking for He's not looking for um, the person who's like, I can do it all right, right? I can do everything right. I'm doing it. Look at me. I'm keeping it right. Just like the rich young ruler. What did he say? I've kept all the commandments, God, talking to Jesus. I've, taught, I've kept all the commandments since I was a little boy, right? And Jesus tells him what? Okay, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And what did the rich young ruler do? He walked away very sad because he could not do that. So God is not looking for perfection, right? He's looking for obedience. That's one thing that we struggle with. We struggle with the obedience, just doing the simple things, just that radical obedience. And so everybody that I'm talking to right now, you are extremely blessed. You are you're 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 watching online you're getting your education you have so much to be grateful for you 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 have no idea how rich you are and so this week i'm asking for you in whatever area and you pray about it whatever area that you don't have radical obedience in that you find a way to to, to get there mentally emotionally and physically OK, because your obedience to something today will give you the future that you want. All right. But if you can't be obedient, especially in a time of challenge, sacrifice and, st and structure that you that you know that you you're looking for, then you won't get those rewards. They're always connected. 
Okay. God says, if you follow my, if you follow my commandments, right? If you honor your mother and father, what your days will be long. And so there's a direct connection to trusting in God. I love that. Yes. Okay. Prayer, prayer, prayer. And so that's just, that's just it for this week, guys. I mean, we, we have to understand that everything, everything to God in prayer. Um, I like this scripture. If you don't have one to think about this week, it is Deuteronomy 31, 8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay. And that's going anywhere, especially into that testing center. <laughs> <laughs> you want the Lord to fight your battle in that testing center, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for class. Hey, this is just the start of it. There is so much more uh, to do, um, but we will do it together. Every Monday at noon, we get to do a part of the program. And then Wednesday, we also get to do a part of the program. But the full course is definitely in the NCLEX V2. I hope to see you there. Um, somebody asked this. I love it. It's about the 30-day challenge. So the 30 day challenge to help guide you during your studying sessions are they are they're all found in the V2. OK, they're all found there in the V2. And the way that you do them is you watch your lecture video. You read your quick facts when it's time, according to the schedule, and then you watch that video. Hold on. Let me just show you. OK. OK, so if you go to V2. The 30 day challenge, let me get this guy out of here. Get out of here. Okay, 30 day challenge is here. This second icon with this young lady that's next to me. So if you click on this young lady, pal, the 30 day challenge video starts here. Okay, so this is the orientation. This is day one. Now the 30 day challenge video is kind of misleading because there's only 20 videos in the 30 day challenge video, but it goes by the study calendar. So like study session number 17. So if you're doing study session number 17, you would go and you would watch number 17's 30 day challenge session. Does that make sense? Okay. And then 18, you watch 18, 19, and then 20, but you start at one and it's always here for you. So you don't have to wait for me. It's here. I will be kicking off probably the 30 day challenge again, um, the start of the new year. Is the 30 day challenge available on the trial? It is. The 30 day challenge is available on the free trial. However, remember, I'm going to be asking you questions from the actual program. So you, you know, you won't have all of those answers if you're not in the full program, but you can still be free to watch those videos if you want to. All right. If you have any questions about your specific account, please email me support at remarreview.com and I love to take a look at your account for you. Okay. All right, everyone, I hope to see you again on Wednesday. We had a great class studying Rye syndrome. We got really deep into the critical thinking aspects of the condition. And so I appreciate all the comments from that. Welcome to all of my new, all of my new watchers. Seems like from Africa today, I had a lot of people from Africa. If you're from Africa, shout out where you are. Okay, Ethiopia, I see South Africa. I love it. I love it. I don't even know what time it is over there, but for you guys fi uh, finding me is amazing. Christina Marie. Hey, that's my middle name. Good morning, Remar family. I took my NCLEX November 30th and passed. I'm so thankful and blessed, but Remar made it possible to pass. Thank you so much, Miss Regina. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Shana, am I saying that right? Oh, so good. Pretty. To God be the glory. I took my NCLEX for the fourth attempt on December 1st. Okay. Wow. What a way to start off December. I'm officially a Remar nurse. I feel, I know that feels so good to be one before uh, Christmas, to be one before Christmas. Oh, that's the dream. That's the dream. Um, nurse Patrick says, praying for all of you um, past the NCLEX. I did it. I passed the NCLEX RN on 11, 29, 23. Oh my goodness. Look at all the people that are passing. Congratulations, Nurse Joan. I passed my NCLEX last month and I'm still here. I'm still here. No, that's, a, that's amazing. Because what we do is beyond NCLEX. This information is going to help you be such a better nurse. This has been the best experience of my life for me. 
it was more than just passing the NCLEX, but believing in myself. Wow, how amazing is that? I passed my NCLEX RN, RN on November 30th. Thank you, Regina. I use V2 and Quick Facts only. Nurse Ramsey. Oh, man. This is it, guys. This is what you want. This is why you do the hard work and show up here because um, these, the Remar nurses are doing that. Congratulations to all of you. And shout out to my people all over. There's so many uh, spotlighting here. Nigeria in the house. It's 7 p.m. in Nigeria. It's good to know. All right. Jamaica, always. It's a pleasure to have you. I miss being there. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you so much for studying with me. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I'll check in with you in the V2 and send me an email if you need anything else. Bye-bye.